farmers. So I was pretty amazed when I got there and they showed me, here he's got this video communication system at his center, and people are sitting there and linked out to villages and are passing information and doing amazing extension work uh, through the most modern technology. So uh, Dr. M.S. Swaminathan is clearly new school in leading this uh, effort. So it's my great pleasure to welcome the chair of the next panel, Dr. M.S. Swaminathan. Thank you very much, Ambassador Kling. As already announced, this particular conversation is about the role of small farmers, farm women and men, in the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. As Ambassador Quinn said, this year, 2010 has been recognized as an international year of biodiversity by the UN system. And I think shortly there's a meeting in Nagoya in Japan, I think this week, to review what has been done in terms of conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. This is particularly appropriate to link this with the Borlaug Dialogue, because I think more than any other plant breeder, agricultural scientist, and a world leader, Norman Borlaug recognizes the importance of genetic diversity. In fact, all the success of his work was based upon a fundamental principle. Genetic homogeneity, genetic homogeneity enhances genetic vulnerability to pests and diseases. Based on this concept, he wanted to have genetic heterogeneity, not homogeneity, in his varieties. So he brought about a pyramiding of genes from diverse sources, whether it was winter wheat or spring wheat, all of them were together. And that's one of the reasons why most of the varieties he bred were not only capable of using solar energy, nutrients and water more efficiently, but also were resistant to a broad spectrum of diseases and pests. In fact, the last year, even last year, one of his last conferences was to fight the UG99 race of stem rust. He was very concerned the stem rust. He has seen it in his younger days, what kind of damage can be caused to crops by rust diseases. Therefore, he decided that he should alert the whole scientific world, political world, on the dangers of new races of rust, just as UG99. So I think it's on this occasion, I hope we can again uh, look back and see what we should do to conserve biodiversity and use it sustainably and equitably. I, if you look at small holders in sustainability, sustainable agriculture, one of the very important uh, uh, methods by which they could ensure sustainability of agriculture was by genetic heterogeneity, bringing a number of varieties, mixed cropping, uh, large number of varieties grown, what we now call land races, over 1,50,000 land races of rice varieties are available, and of them more than 100,000 are in the gene bank of the International Rice Research Institute. Farmers have always valued diversity. They are the great conservers. In the broad world of biodiversity, if you take agro-biodiversity, economically important crops and so on, agro-diversity is the product of interaction between biodiversity and cultural diversity on one hand, and biodiversity and culinary diversity on the other hand, the way in which we use the grains, a very large number. If you read the books written by Noel Vietmeyer, uh, who is a biographer of Norman Borlaug, The Lost Crops of the Incas, The Lost Crops of Africa, and so on, you will see what a wide range of crops on which the local food security, as well as the health security, that is medicinal plants, both were really built on a wide, very great diversity. Gradually, with the market-oriented agriculture, we have uh, been compressing the wood basket Hardly four, five, six crops today are important. There were several hundred crops in the past. But one good thing which is happening now, 
with the climate change, it is now being recognized. The climate resilient agriculture has to be built on the foundation of biodiversity. It has to be genetic diversity so that gene banks from a warming planet have once again attracted considerable attention. I bore log, let me also say, even when we were in the late 60s, we were discussing about the underutilized crops and he encouraged the formation of an international council for underutilized crops when Lazarov was the first director. Unfortunately, he didn't receive that kind of support, but I want to mention the importance of a wide grain borlog was always interested in diversifying the food habits, bringing in a large number of local grains and so on. And that uh, the kind of uh, work now is fortunately receiving more attention. Now, in the case of small farmers, it's largely mostly women have been the great conservers. From the time over 12,000 years ago, the transformation took place from purely food gathering to food growing. You find a very great contribution in the selection of variety, the selection of species were all done by women. Where we work in my own center, which Ambassador Quinn kindly visited the seminar, but where we work in the interior parts of India, uh, what are called sometimes tribal areas, you may call indigenous people, you find an enormous work which is being done by those people, local people, to conserve biodiversity. For example, one group of workers, mainly women, who developed a system of community conservation of biodiversity through gene banks in, in situ on farm conservation. In other words, the land races. Cryogenic is only preservation. But on-farm conservation is evolution plus preservation, and that is different. They have constructed gene banks, seed banks, grain banks, and water banks. It, this received the Equator Initiative Award at Rio de, at, uh, at, uh, at, uh, uh, Rio de Janeiro, and also later on at Buenos Aires. Uh, these people are honored. Similarly, they have always considered to be biodiversity as their ally. In, in sustainable agriculture. Whenever there is drought, whenever the floods, the large number of varieties help them in order to save something at least is obtained. And uh, this kind of conservation efforts will have to revitalize now for promoting a climate resilient agriculture. But we are sure to do something to recognize and reward these farmers. There is no use in saying small farmers are the custodians of genetic diversity, but they also require some recognition and reward this is why both the Global Biodiversity Convention as well as the FAO Treaty on Farmers' Rights have specially made uh, uh, suggestions how people should recognize and reward the conservation traditions of local communities of small farmers. In India, we have what we call a Genome Savior Award for those farm families and communities who have been able to conserve land races of various varieties. These kinds of uh, steps are needed for what the local people themselves have called in the one of the places where we work. It is called by botanists and by biodiversity experts as a hotspot, as an agro-biodiversity or biodiversity hotspot, the area in Orissa called uh, Koraput. But what the women have done there is uh, they decided to form a society. Local name can be converted into English as Biohappiness Society. And the purpose of the Biohappiness Society is to ensure the conservation, sustainable use, and equitable sharing of benefits of biodiversity. In other words, they finally say the Biohappiness Society will convert a hot spot into a happy spot. And today we are now going to hear from our panelists how to convert the biodiversity hot spots into happy spots and thereby ensure sustainable food security for all. I have great pleasure 